guys! What's up? It's Stephanie Liu and welcome to another episode of Lights Camera Live. For those of you that are joining us, go ahead and leave a comment. Let me know where you're tuning in from. I'm here in San Diego. If you're watching the replay, go ahead and leave a comment. Hashtag replay. Today we're going to be talking about GDPR. If you don't know what the heck that means, then this is the episode for you because if you're a small business owner, this is definitely something that you want to pay attention to. All right, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and switch the screen. I'm going to show you behind who's behind door number two. Boom, Mike Alton. Hey! <gasps> All right, we ready to do this? We are. It's like magic. I, like, I love Ecamm. You're using Ecamm too, right? Yeah, although obviously I'm on Skype now. So this you is, I'm, I'm like, I'm like old school. I don't get to have all the fun stuff if I'm the guest. Oh, yeah. You don't get to play with your mixers. <laughs> Error. I'm, I'm using the mixer right now. <laughs> in fact, please, if you're watching, tell me this sounds good. Because yes. for heaven's sake, I spent a lot of money on this mixer, and it hasn't been working out too well for me. So say, hey, Mike, yeah, that sounds oh. good, or it sounds like rubbish. You need to send it back. Well, hey, guess what? Mitch is here. So, Mitch, if, if Mike's... <laughs> If Mike's mic is not working, please let him know. We'll cry him a little river for a little second, and then he needs to get back on the show to talk to us about GDPR. So having said that, what's up, Mitch Jackson? So awesome to have you here. We also have Brenda, Charlene, Krisha. Krisha, you girl, you've been like everywhere. You were watching the last live stream. I love it. Digging it. All right, cool. Um, so today, you guys, we're going to we're, we are going to talk about GDPR. Mm. I've had way too much coffee because I was with UV just like 15 minutes ago, right? Yeah. Um, but honestly, you guys, today we're going to be talking about GDPR and why it's important for you to pay attention, right? Because it does affect any of you guys that have been using freebies and lead magnets and whatnot to grow your email list, right? Mm -hmm. So Mike Alton is going to show us how we can go ahead and comply with the GDPR, right? And what happens if you don't? And I say that with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> and I say that with a smile. So having <laughs> said that, let's go ahead and dive right in because this is one of those things where the deadline is tomorrow. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Okay, cool. Yep. All right, so first off, Mike, break it down. What the heck is GDPR? Why should I care? Yeah, and before we even start, I'm going to do exactly what, what Mitch and his pal Joey did, which is to give you the big fat legal disclaimer. Oh. We are not lawyers. We are not even GDPR experts. So I would consider uh, us to be informed, mm. right? We've done our homework. We've done the reading. Uh, we've studied. You know, some of us have studied more than others. Just saying. <laughs> oh, I got, I got my finger right this time. <laughs> but you know this what we're trying to do is is help each other help you guys sort through all this stuff there's a lot of terminology a lot of confusing stuff that's going on there's deadlines and there's scary things like that and i'm hoping that between the two of us we can go through this quickly and make this as easy as possible for you to at least understand the basic ramifications the basic things that are being talked about with gdbr so that by the end of this hour either you're going to feel like you got this and you're good or you're going to feel like you need more help, and that's where you want to take a next step. Like talk to somebody like Mitch, uh, who's in the audience. He's an attorney, so that's who you want to talk to when you want that's actual legal yeah. advice. There are organizations out thing. there, uh, particularly if you're doing business in the EU. There are EU organizations that you can talk to that understand <laughs> why the EU writes the things that they write and the way that they write them in their law. So. This is just to help you. This isn't to give you specific legal advice. Oh. So there's my disclaimer that will prevent any of you from coming to me later and saying, well, you told me to do it this way. Uh, um, we're not going to go there. So I'm going to do this Will Smith style and say, general data protection regulation. Let's break that down one word at a time. General, everybody. This applies to everybody. This is an EU law, but it applies to the entire world, and we're going to get into that in a little moment, but that's what general means. It's not just for the Germans or the Italians. Oh. It's everybody. Second word, data. This is what tricks a lot of people up. The word data means anything that's personally identifiable to an individual, their name, their email address. Mm-hmm. The credit card information, their physical address, any other kind of specific information that you can tie to that individual person uh, for something that might be health-related 
information, uh, you know, other kinds of finance information, personal stuff that you might ask in a forum, uh, anything that's personal to that individual, that's data. And if you're collecting that kind of data and you're potentially collecting it from somebody who is in the EU, you need to pay attention to the rest of this call. Oh, yeah. he just took a <clears throat> sip of his coffee because he's like, we're about to get into it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then, third word, protection. This is about protecting people. It's not about hurting businesses, although to an extent it's about hurting businesses that spam, which is why everything gets ruined. I mean, we like to say, we joke all the time, marketers ruin everything, right? This is what has happened over the years. Businesses have taken advantage of people, taken advantage of the ease at which they could get data from individuals and then use that data in all kinds of wonderful ways and not so wonderful ways. And so people in Europe, governments in Europe, are trying to help the individual consumers keep their information as private as possible and to understand how the businesses that they work with are going to use that information. And again, we're going to go into more detail Mm -hmm. on all these different things. But the last word, fourth word, regulation. And this is actually a really important word. In the European Union, which is a collection of countries, they have directives and they have regulations. Directives, and some of you might actually be familiar with a couple of these, the cookie directive, and then there was another directive even older than that. Those are like guidelines, to, to, to quote Pirates of the Caribbean. They're more like guidelines, really. There were suggestions from the EU governing body to the individual EU states saying, you know, we really want you. We think you should. We really appreciate it if you created a law inside your state Mm-hmm. That protected your own state's citizens against, say, cookies. Yeah. Right. So now you're if you're if you're advertising uh, or if uh, you people are coming to your website, you're supposed to have a little banner that notifies them that you're collecting cookies and uh, you know you're creating a cookie for them and you're collecting data and what you're going to do that for. So the regulation is different. A what? regulation is an actual law that wipes out, I shouldn't say wipes out, it applies to every state in the EU. And to, and to those of us like in the United States, we're like, well, okay, what's the difference? Well, the difference is between a state law and a federal law. Here in the U.S., we have individual states, and some of them have laws um, that are the same as other states, and some of them have laws that are different than other states. For instance, whether or not you can carry a gun around and have it concealed or not. There's different laws in different states. And if you were going to participate or use a gun or carry a gun in one state or another, you'd have to be familiar with those laws in order to do that. Whereas we also have federal laws that apply across the board and the states don't get any say in how that works. So it's the same thing in the EU. This is a regulation. GDPR is a regulation. It's a law that applies to the entire European Union, no matter what the states say. And by the way, it also includes Britain because... The law, the regulation was passed in 2016 before Brexit. Hmm. So they're part of this. Mike Alton is dropping geography. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm so yeah, happy I read that blog post. <laughs> it's attacking Normandy and, and what? No, we're not going to do history. Very cool. All right. So for those of you guys that are just tuning in, we are talking about GDPR and how it's, it's going to apply to you and your business. Um, Mike just Mike just basically dropped it down to let you guys know what it pretty much stands for and how it's not just it's sh- even though it's happening in the European Union it's still it's still going to apply to you. So definitely pay attention and if you haven't already get your notebook out, start writing stuff down. If you have any questions by all means drop them in the comments. Oh my god. <laughs> Seriously, I have a notebook. These are my notes. I have GDPR and I have pages of notes myself because can you can you xerox that can you scan an attorney, that? i gotta know this stuff and yeah I'm, yeah i'm it's dude it's the dark lord what can i say um, <laughs> okay cool so having said that if again if you guys have any questions by all means drop them in the comments because i'll be monitoring them i'll obviously be switching the camera too between myself and mike so um just going through this stuff all right so cool we talked about what gdpr gdpr is can we just say good bro <laughs> <laughs> Gibber. 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 Um, so why do business not in the EU need to think about GDPR? Like, why should I care? 
Yeah, and that's that's really the crux of it, I think, or at least where, where most people need to start is why why should you care? My business is here in the U.S. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. You're in San Diego, California. Why do we care? It's complicated. <laughs> like a relationship, right? It's complicated. So it starts with first understanding whether or not you have EU customers, like actual paying customers, right? Because that's, that's going to impact you in that way. And it also starts with understanding whether or not you have people coming to your, your online site and maybe subscribing mm. in the EU. But at, at the crux of it, it's do you have or do you have the potential to receive that personal data that we talked about a second ago from an EU citizen, because or, or even really anybody who's actually in the EU, they don't have to be a citizen. They're just physically in, a, in an EU country, which is weird to me, but okay. If you have that potential or if you have it existing, that data, then you need to be in compliance with GDPR because it applies to you. They want anybody in the world who is taking their citizens and their their users and their residents' information, they want them to be compliant. They want them to be explicit about what they're taking, what, what data they're collecting, how they're storing it, how they're using it so that their citizens know. Yeah. And as businesses outside of the EU, there's still the potential there that we could be participating in that process and, and collecting that information. And so you're going to want to be compliant. Yes. That's it's a matter, though, of determining what risk, what amount of risk you're willing to accept. Because full-on compliance, frankly, is something that not everybody's going to be able to do. What do you mean Full-on that? compliance would mean, for instance, having a representative in the EU. Oh. Someone who actually literally lives and works in the EU representing your business. So I'd have to have somebody from the social media hat as an EU representative. I'd have to pay them uh, to be my eyes and ears, to be my contact. If, if, a, if a member state of the EU wanted to get in touch with my business, that's just because I p- could potentially have somebody from the EU coming to my site and signing up for one of my services or maybe even hiring me. I, I do business around the world, not that much in the EU, uh-huh. but it can happen. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I just, I'm not. I'm going to tell you right here on video, I am not going to hire somebody to sit in the EU and be my quote-unquote representative. Okay, That's wait, not but what if it was me? What if I just said, like, hey, Mike, I'll sit in the EU for you? Like, would that be cool? <laughs> I will totally sit in the EU you for bucks, anyone. Send you a Starbucks gift card and we're good. Hey, I got to pay rent. <laughs> yeah, so there's those kinds of considerations. There's um, – my camera's like – let's see if that works. All right. Uh, there's, there's, there's all these little details and nuance that you could do if you wanted to be fully compliant. And the larger your business, the more widespread your exposure to European Union people is – the more risk you are at of falling against the GDPR, Gidipper, and uh, therefore the more attention you're going to want to pay to you know these different things that, that you could potentially want to do. Got it. Okay, so what happens if I what if I what if I'm like Mary? I'm just kidding, Mary. <laughs> what if I'm a small business owner? I'm just like you know what? I'm just not going to pay attention to this. Right now, because life is happening and I don't have time for this. What what are the potential risks that might happen? There's several risks. So at a very, very broad, high level, you risk offending, upsetting, turning off people in the EU who have come to you, they've given you their information, and they realize somehow that you aren't compliant. Maybe they sign up to get an ebook and after you email them the ebook, you start emailing them newsletters, mm. which they did not agree to, to receive. And we're going to get into this in a second, uh, what this all means. But you do something like that or maybe um, somebody breaks into your office and steals your computer and you don't let your contacts know. Why would you, right? Uh, but you complain about it on Facebook because like, damn it. My computer's gone. All my stuff's on there. And then one of these EU people that knows they're on your list, that knows you have their information, says, wait, what a minute? 
Yeah. You didn't tell me that somebody took your computer with my information on it. I mean, we see this with big corporations, right? We see this with the credits and um, Equifax, I think. Yeah, Equifax had a data breach. Yahoo has a data (laughs) breach. They're obligated to tell people, right? Well, according to the GDPR, you are now obligated to tell people as well. If you have that kind of a breach, whether it's a physical, you know, somebody steals your stuff or somebody hacks into your website or some service or, or your app, if you have an app of some kind. So those are data breaches and you're not obligated to do that. And mm-hmm. if you don't, somebody could complain. Well, so this is where the second issue comes in. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, like, how many of you guys that are watching right now do have freebies and lead magnets on your website? Like, I know I do. I have, like, all these different entry points of here's the Facebook Live workbook, here's the Facebook group, right? Um, if you guys have any lead magnets, just go ahead and be like, yeah, that's me. Just just so we know, like, how many people this is going to impact potentially. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so then that's that's basically a breach of trust, right? When you fail to do something that the GDPR says you should be doing and somebody in the EU figures it out, mm-hmm. um, they're going to be upset with you. Maybe that's all it is. Maybe that's just one upset person. But if they complain to the EU governing body and the EU governing body says, yeah, Stephanie, you're not in compliance. So we don't know yet exactly what that's going to look like. We don't know how it's going to be enforced. And again, this is where part of that, you know, understanding your risk and understanding how much risk you're willing to accept comes in. But the GDPR is very clear that if a company is found to be in violation of the GDPR, they could be fined up to 4% of your annual revenue or 20 million euros, whichever is greater. (laughs) So... For those of you who aren't making a lot of money in your in your little side hustle, there you thought, oh, four percent, whatever. That's uh, it's like forty bucks for me, right? But uh, no, 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 no. Uh, they could be finding you quite a bit more. Now it is, they can tier it. That's not every single fine, every single violation. You've got a form without an opt in, and then they're going to find you twenty million euros. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, they can decide the severity of it if it's a breach, like on the level of a, of a you know expedient. Or whatever, not Expedian. Equifax. Uh, Equifax. <laughs> if, Equifax. Uh, sorry, I don't want to scare the people at Expedian. Uh, <laughs> if it's a breach at that level, then yeah, I mean, the massive amount of fines that they can levy, uh, you know, for something else, it'll probably be a lot less. But we just don't know. Yeah. And we don't know how they're going to sort that out. I mean, they don't have, uh, as, as Mari said in her broadcast yesterday, there is no GDPR police. Yeah. Waiting to pounce on people around the world when they're not in compliance. That doesn't exist. They're going to have to sort that out. They're in the process of sorting that out. Yeah. Which is also to say that technically speaking, if you're not fully compliant by tomorrow, there's nobody that's going to be outside your door Saturday morning with some kind of a subpoena attached to a fine. It doesn't exist yet. Man, I so mean, don't panic. Honestly, I just feel like there's a, like I know when I first signed up for my LLC, right? And I got like my, my registered trademark and whatnot. I got like a bunch of fake spam letters that would say like, oh, you didn't post your, your hourly wage stuff in your break room. So we're going to fine you and blah, blah, blah. I just imagine that there's going to be a bunch of bad actors out there. They're going to say like, hey, your website is not GDPR compliant. No, 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 you get fined. So for those of you guys, I mean, this is, this is a really good episode because we're going to talk about like things that you should do next in your business. That way you don't get duped by, by those people. Um, but go ahead. What were you going to say again? That there's a third component here in terms of you know what's going to happen to me if 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 I don't comply. You know there was there was you know breach of user trust, yeah, uh, which could potentially be a big deal. I mean because people could start tweeting about it and and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know there's the potential for fines. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know if they're even going to be able to find anybody out of the EU. The, the U.S. government might say, no way, we're not going to cooperate. Yeah. Um, and with Congress today, who knows if they're even understanding what GDPR means. Maybe they should be watching this video. Well, I mean, based off of the Facebook Congress testimony. I, mean, I know. That's what I'm saying. They're like, is that a cereal? What is GDPR? Is it? I liked Ken's no. comment. Ken Ken was saying that the GDPR MIB was going to stop by your house and be like, "Where's your compliance?" Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what it's going to be. That's you know Will Smith. See, 
Will Smith episode. Circle. Hey. <laughs> But the third thing, and here's their bigger issue, um, it, it's a forward-thinking issue. Suppose you decide in five years that you want to take your game to a global level and you really want to start marketing in the EU. You yeah. want to start helping big, big brands and organizations in the EU with their Facebook advertising and their Facebook lives and that sort of thing. At that point, you're going to have to be compliant. You're going to have to have a representative. You're going to have to have a data processing officer. Those are requirements of doing business in the EU. Wait, 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 wait. I was about to take a sip of my coffee, and then you said something that I was just like, oh, snap. Say that again? If you decide you want to do business in the EU, well, whether it's right now or five years from now, there are certain things that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to have the EU representative that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to have to hire a data processing officer who works for you and is your representative. But these are all requirements that, that most of you listening right now aren't worried about. The point is five years from now, you decide that you're going to do this. It's a hypothetical. So five okay. years, you decide, okay, I'm going to make this step. I'm going to hire some people in the EU and I'm going to start marketing myself all over the EU. The, here's the problem. What if in a year from now, you were cited by the EU governing organization because you were not in compliance with the GDPR. Mm -hmm. And then five years from now, you now want to do business in the in the EU. They've got you on record as not being compliant with the GDPR. How likely are you to be approved for any kind of approvals that are required to do business in the EU if they already know that you aren't doing what you are supposed to be doing and you've been doing it for years? Well, that's so, interesting because like, – so I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick because yeah. – like even someone like me, like I have students that have taken the Lights Camera Live course and they're in the EU, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Are you now saying I need representation in the EU? No. In your example, yeah, we're talking about very, very few people. Okay. Right. We're really in in this example because I don't mean to sound trite, but. <laughs> Yours is a small to medium business. Okay. Your business is not the size of business that we believe the EU is going to be truly concerned about. And even if it is, you're legit. You're actually helping people. People are happy to pay you for what you do because you do an amazing job and they're not complaining. You're not abusing the data that they give you mm -hmm. or any of those things. But other businesses are larger. Yes. Other businesses have a lot more holes in terms of the kind of data that they're collecting and what they're doing with that data and how they're securing that data. So, for instance, one of the stipulations of the GDPR is that you're not allowed to collect data unless you actually need it, right? So, on my sign-up form, I can't ask people for what city they're from unless I have a legitimate need to know that particular information. If I'm just asking – if I just need their email address to send them – an ebook yeah. and their name so that I can refer to them. I'm not allowed to ask those other questions. Oh. At least I have to, I have, what I have to do is I have to say, this is why I need that information. And you have to know that I'm collecting that information and what I'm going to use it for and how I'm going to keep it secure and all these other stipulations. So those are the things that we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. and we're going to get all that. We're going to go into more detail on all those things in just a second. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is in terms of, you know, should I be worried about GDPR? The answer is yes, if you have aspirations for doing a lot more work in the EU down the road, then make sure that your business is compliant today. So that, frankly, you don't piss off people, you know, government regulators in the EU today and make it harder for yourself in the future. Got it. Okay, cool. All right. I'm like, my brain is all thinking now. Like, this is, this is honestly, you guys, I'm probably not going to be talking a lot because in my brain, I'm just like, oh my God, I need to write that down. <laughs> Uh, I need to timestamp this. Okay, so where do businesses start then? How do I, like, what do I need to start focusing on today? Glad you asked, because there are three things, three big things that we need to figure okay, out. Okay, hold up. I need, I need notebook. Yep, get the notebook out. <laughs> okay. The, I'm, I'm calling these the big three. The big now, three. Cool. This is for, like, every business. Mm -hmm. This big three is for every business. Now, larger businesses, enterprise-level businesses, you guys, 
Well, frankly, if you're watching this show, you needed to have been worried about this three months ago because you got a lot to do and you need to hire people. You need to hire a consultant, probably have full-time staff devoted to this because bigger businesses are collecting information from a lot of different places Mm -hmm. and storing it in a lot of different places. You've got spreadsheets, you've got CRMs, you've got uh, sales databases, and you've got roaming sales reps with their laptops, and, and you've got all this stuff to figure out. Most of us don't have that, right? Most mm-hmm. of us watching this, I'm pretty sure today, solopreneurs, small businesses. So it's, it's, it's a lot easier for us. So number one. Okay. And I'm calling this determine consent. Consent is one of the words that we need to talk about. I need to go back to my, my, the rest of my notes because I have terminology that we're going to talk about. Okay. Consent is a big, big word in the GDPR. Consent is this idea that as somebody who has given you information, I know exactly what information I gave you, why you needed it, mm-hmm. what you're going to do with it, and how you're keeping it, how you're storing it, how you're keeping it secure. So th- that means it's not enough to just say, here, give me your email address. I'm going to send you my Facebook uh, hacks and tips. That's one of the resources that I give people on my site. Uh-huh. It's this ebook, and it's it's great. People love it, and it's it takes them through all these hacks and tips. And I just say, here, here's this resource. I'm going to email it to you. I don't tell them that after they get that, they're going to be on my general email list, that they're going to get blog post notifications from me, that they might get sales offers, they might get event notifications like this one. That was always understood. Yeah. I mean, this is this is standard practice for, for online businesses and online marketers. Yeah. You have lead magnets, which bring the leads in. You magnetize them and bring them in. You magnetize and then them. you shower them with love. I just imagine like this big old magnet like... Yeah, well, you know what? That's the... Magnetized you. I talked about it. Okay. But now with the GDPR, that's not good enough. In fact, it's not even good enough to say on your form or on your opt-in that, uh, you know, we're going to email this to you and, oh, and by the way, you'll also then get our newsletters and all that kind of stuff. You, that's not good enough. People who sign up for your list, they have the right now, according to the GDPR, so this only applies to the EU, uh, people who are in the EU, they have the right to only get what you're offering and not have to get anything else. Yeah. Okay. So I saw that because before even this, this interview, I hopped into my convert kit and they had this little, they had this little banner at the top that was saying, Hey, like we are going to make sure that it's going to be easier for you to find out if people subscribing to your list are, um, are from the EU. And like they made it where it's, it's a checkbox to say, Yes, I'm getting this free read, but then yes, I also want promotional emails and all that other stuff. And I thought that was kind of cool to have a an email service provider that was like, "Cool, we got you. This is how we do it." Boom. Yeah. Um, nice. Okay. So, <clears throat> the question then becomes: You ever done that? No. You ever had a form on your site? that people could subscribe for one thing and now you're using their information in other ways that they didn't expressly consent to be used in that way. Yeah, I see. And that's like, that was the other conversation that you and I were talking about was even doing Facebook ads for clients, right? Usually standard practice would be, hey, give me your email list so I could create a custom audience from your list of subscribers. And if your client doesn't have that in their privacy policy, like by you signing up for this, we also may use your data for, for Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. So now I'm seeing like MailChimp and ConvertKit. Most of these are, are giving their users a set of checkboxes. This is the easiest way to do it is to have a set of checkboxes. Anytime you're offering somebody or allowing somebody to sign up, contact you, provide you with that information, provide you with an email address or more, have check boxes that say, would you also like to receive, or is it okay if we also send you whatever language you want to use, check boxes that say things like marketing materials, promotional offers, and customized digital advertising. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Those check boxes have to be unchecked. They cannot be checked by default. This is not an opt-out 
scenario. They have to opt into those things, which means if they do not opt in to customized online advertising, then you can't serve them things like retargeting at Facebook ads. Got it. Okay. All right. Sorry, I'm, so I'm that's the big thinking. first thing. That's the big first question. If you in the audience, you're sitting there thinking, that doesn't apply to me. I, I've, I've never, I, I, I don't do email marketing. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've never collected email addresses like that. You know, mm-hmm. or maybe, maybe your form has pretty much always been in compliance. Maybe the only form on your site is subscribe to website updates, yeah. and it's very clear that the only thing that they're going to get from you, and the only thing that they do get from you, is an update from your website. Yeah. You're fine. That was There's the part. Yeah, that was the part that I was so happy about with my convert <laughs> kit because I was like, "Oh, I like properly named my forms." I was like, "Oh yeah, God!" Yeah, I was like, "Good job, Steph. Good job, Steph." Yeah, me and not then, so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, "Okay, cool." There's one where it just says like, "Give me updates," and I was like, "That's good." Um, but then you and I were also talking about chatbots because some people are using mm-hmm. chatbots to collect data and notify people via Facebook Messenger. Um, so is that the same thing now? Where because like people can watch like a Facebook Live episode and I'll say leave the comment, subscribe, and by leaving that comment, you are subscribing to an episode. Which, by the way, I did not hook up for this one, so don't <laughs> don't do that. Um, but that's them opting in for me to only tell them about when a new episode goes on air. So, like, let's say I have one of my chatbot subscribers from the EU, and they only opted in to get updates of when I go live. That also means that I can't sneak in there and, like, try to put them into a sequence or a funnel. Is that right? That's exactly right. If the language of the chatbot says they're subscribing to be notified when you go live... That's the only thing you're allowed to to do for them. Um, So, again, it goes back to language. Now, depending on the chat bot and how you're setting it up, you know, what you're talking about is uh, they're they're giving you their email, Mm -hmm. right? Some people use chat bots to create uh, a private message using Facebook Messenger. You got nothing to worry about there because you're still within the Facebook environment and it's Facebook's agreement with their users that have you covered. Wait, 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 say that again. Not legal advice. (laughs) Wait, wait, no, 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 say that again. Well, you're using stuff inside of Facebook, right? So let's say, um, like, Andrew and Pete's a great example, right? You go to Andrew and Pete's Facebook page. um, You can, you can, you can message them and have conversations with their messenger. And you can, you can do things like have their messaging bots automatically let you know whenever they have new videos. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do anything special. There, because that's all within the Facebook environment. I'm a Facebook user engaging with other Facebook users or Facebook pages. And anything that I choose to do, that's covered within Facebook's terms of use and Facebook's data privacy statements and policy policy privacy policies okay. um, and so on. It's only when you're collecting that information and taking it elsewhere, mm-hmm. right, like collecting an email address and adding it to your subscriber list. Mm-hmm. That's when now you need to be hyper aware of what you're collecting, why you're doing it, have you asked for express permission, and have they given it to you? So how are people supposed to like keep track of that? Well, that's where it gets more complex the larger your organization is and the longer you've been doing it and the different ways that you've been doing it. I'm a good example in, in this regard. I have about a dozen different opt-ins on my sites. Mm-hmm. I have about a dozen different ways that people can sign up to get an ebook or a content upgrade or a worksheet or a resource or a digital download of some kind. They're all a little bit different. And so at some point, I'm going to have to go through and edit each one of those and make sure that the opt in is very clear that in addition to that, I want to send you other marketing offers. And I'm going to have to sell people on that so that they check the buttons. Until then, I don't have time to do that right now. I'm busy doing live video. So (laughs) what I've done is I've gone into my email service and my pop-up provider. I happen to use Wishpond. They all pretty much these days offer this kind of a deal where you can go in and you can exclude the EU from seeing those campaigns or pop (laughs) I'm sorry, EU. (laughs) You can't sit here because you're too freaking high maintenance. No, (laughs) Sorry for those for those for those of you guys that are new. Like, 
Mike Alton and I have like mean girls jokes just like running all the time, but yeah, EU, if you don't wear pink on Wednesdays, you can't sit here. You can't be on my email list. <laughs> Rules a rule. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so to buy myself some time, yeah. I've just shut that off. And it's pretty cool within Wishpond because there's a across the board setting I can just say no. No. No EU for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then um as I as Wait, I, edit, I have to take myself and, off camera. <laughs> <laughs> As I edit each campaign, I can turn that back on. So, like, the first thing I've edited is my general newsletter. I've got a newsletter subscription page. I link to it all over the place. If somebody just wants to know when I've got a new blog post or when I've got a new event, they can sign up for my newsletter. It's very straightforward. I don't have to put all kinds of extra checkboxes there. I updated that page and that sign-up form, and then I turned it on. So now, if you're watching in the EU, please join my newsletter community. You're welcome. Now there. you're welcome. For Stephanie, no. No, yeah, y'all I'm just... just it, but you can have my newsletter. You can stay on that side. <laughs> okay, so... So that's one thing that you can do is is um, go through those forms. Okay. Um, but <clears throat> the, 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 before you do that, and the second of the big three things to do yeah. is you've got to update your privacy policy. Yep. Which for some of you means you have to have... A privacy policy. You know, I know I, some of you maybe don't have a privacy policy, but you're going to have one now. Yeah, I felt like um, when I first started my business, I, I was very fortunate that, like, in my mastermind, I had a friend who had a cousin that is a lawyer. She's super kick ass, and she's like, These are all the things that you need. And I was like, Really? I need, like, a policy and yada, yada, yada. Um, so that was just like, Okay, cool. Got that. Good. But when you say that you have to update your privacy policy for GDPR, is it to say, specifically how you're going to use that data and all that good stuff. Well, kids, let's open our hymnals. <clears throat> Go to page 18 <clears throat> where I read to you everything that your data, your privacy policy now must include. This isn't the actual language. Um, for those of you who want to save some time and make this as easy on yourselves as possible, just Google GDPR data privacy generator, example, sample, template. There's there's lots of places out there that you can go to. Again, if you are a big, big business, don't do this. Talk to a data privacy specialist. Talk to a data privacy attorney mm -hmm. like Joey Vitale who can help you make sure that your language is very, very specific, appropriate, and correct for your business. But for most of us, honestly, this is fine. You, Because I went, I went to a service this week and I, I basically said, okay, I'm using these third-party apps like Google Analytics, and I'm a small business. Here's my business name, and I churned out the language that I need. The language that you need, it's got to cover, like you said, the specif it's got to specify the type of data that you are collecting. In my case, it was always first name, last name, email address. That's the only data that I collect mm -hmm. on my website, but your website might be different. Uh, and Mitch, uh, you know, Mitch and Joey did a, their video last week, and now Mitch, on his contact form, now asks for your country of origin, and if it's in the United States, he might even ask for your address, which means in Mitch's data policy, he's got to say that he asks for that information. So you're so, saying just copy and paste Mitch's? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, no, Mitch. No, that ain't <laughs> Then you gotta you gotta outline what are you gonna do with that data? Yeah, you know what are you using it for? Um, is it just to to contact uh, you know people and keep them in touch? And, and for most of us, it's going <laughs> the answer is going to be to deliver the services that they asked for. I feel like That's this needs to be like an data. SNL skit. Like oh. I should dress up like a like a like an email popped in and be like, "Hey, you want this freebie?" And then you're you're sitting there at the keyboard like. But what are you going to do with my data? Like, what you, oh, I'm going to do this. <laughs> what do you need that for? I know. I no, we should really. totally do a skit. Wait, we need to get Owen on this. Owen is totally going to act it out with like him and Judge Judy, like by all means. <laughs> Don't be like, I am an influencer and a thought leader. You are just going to give me all of your data. We and should. I don't have to tell you what I'm going to do with it. I'm telling you, it'd be really funny if it's like, remember the old school um, Apple versus Mac? Yes. Commercials? Yes. Like, well, I don't want to be GDPR compliant. Okay, we're totally off topic. I have second cup of coffee, not a good idea, but all right, go for it. <laughs> well, you know, we, we talked before we went live. We don't want to be scary. We don't want to be dull and humdrum about this because it's serious, but at the same time, I mean, 
Look who we're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> the two of us, we're not going to be any of those things. Oh, so. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait, wait. Can I, like, sidetrack you one more time? Yeah. How, did you ever see this one viral article where this guy created this landing page and it just says, like, hey, give me your email address, right? And that's like, what? And then you keep scrolling down. I was like, no, really? Can I have your email address? And then it kept going down. He's like, no, seriously, come on. Just give me your email address and I'll get out of your hair. And I was like, that feels like every single freaking marketer, like when you hit their land, he's like, give me your email address. And now yeah. if you and I were to do this skit, we'd be like, just give me your email address because this is what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to open up like a loan. I'm going to go buy a house. I promise I'll keep it private. I promise. <laughs> all right. Cool. Okay. Back to seriousness. I know Serious. that we're so, on like number two. Good. That's all right. Yeah. So, um, you have to indicate where the data is stored. Now, that's only applicable if you are personally storing data. I'm using Wishpom, which means I'm using a third-party service. Using, you're using ConvertKit. You're using a third-party service. And one of the cool things here mm-hmm. is that you get to just say, hey, go look at their data <laughs> Their their privacy policy. If you really want to know more, um, because they're the ones who are actually having to secure that data. Mm-hmm. Wait, wait, wait. But what about from the Facebook advertising piece? Because like we said, yeah. is when clients send me their email list and then I make a custom audience, I now have, I have that data. Whoa, huh? I love this question. Let's circle back to it because okay. it's your client who would have to have something to that effect in their privacy policy. Okay. So we're going to come back to that. Um, In fact, the next point is who will access it. So they would have to say, we may use your information for customized online advertising, and we may provide that with our third-party consultants and vendors and tools like Ad Espresso uh, and Facebook and and Google AdWords or whatever the case might be uh, to serve you those ads. Okay. Okay. Uh, you need to talk about what security measures you might be taking. And again, most of this is for people who actually personally have that data themselves in their own systems, their own servers, in their own spreadsheets, and so on. If, like me, it's really all third-party stuff, Google Analytics, Discus. I had I put Discus because I people can leave comments on my site, and yeah. that counts. Yeah. Okay, commenting systems. Um, and then the last big thing is contact info. You have to have up-to-date contact info. Um for people who have questions, for people who want to change their data, for people who want to have access to the data, which brings me to the other requirements. And I'm going to run through these really quick, and then if people have questions, we can we can dig into this, or sure. if you have questions. Uh, we already talked about consent. There's eight of these. Uh, privacy by design is just this concept that you're doing everything that you can to protect the privacy of these individuals to not collect information that you don't need to keep it secure and all those things. So this is where the entire organization has to be involved. And we'll talk about this if we have more time, but that means having training for the other people that work for you so that they understand how to handle customer data. Do you have sales yeah. reps, like you said, that are taking laptops out to Starbucks and connecting to public Wi-Fis, and they've got customer data on those laptops. They need to be careful with that stuff. So, you know, we will we we'll probably talk a little bit about, like, organizations like Privacy Skills. Yeah. Uh, especially Privacy Awareness Academy at privacyskills.com. They'll help you train all of your staff to understand oh, what are they doing Oh, you do that Privacy that Skills? PrivacySkills.com. So that what they do is you you buy seats and then you go you have your staff your employees go through online training to, to like okay who's got access to the server room right do we have you know proper security in place for our systems on site are we not just blindly emailing stuff are we keeping our Google Docs secure or are we just linking that anybody can view the document if they've got that link those kinds of really <laughs> Really gritty stuff. Yeah. You're laughing. Well, no, because I was just all like, oh, like Google Docs. And like, yeah, because when I I shared. I know. I was like, God darn it. I should not have had the camera on me when you said that. I wear my emotions (laughs) on my sleeves, you guys. Um, Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So then, um, but then real quick, there's a couple of things. We talked about breach notification before. Um, There's two other things data portability and right to be forgotten that are kind of weird. So data portability means if somebody in the EU knows that you have their data, they have the right to come to you and ask you for you to give them that data. And if it's possible, you have to give them that data in a way that they can give it to another vendor. 
most of you, this doesn't apply. Yeah, because I would imagine it's like, well, then apply. I would just be handing back over to you your name and your email. Like, you need me to tell you your name and your email address? Really? Are you you? Mary, Are you you? is that your problem? <laughs> Sorry, Mary. You know. <laughs> Sorry, Marys of the world. <laughs> but um, but yeah, for 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 apps and larger companies and vendors, you know, like you know, let's say that uh, um, you're Edward Jones, right? And you're managing a financial portfolio for somebody else, and they want to move that portfolio to another vendor. You have to give them their data, and if you if it's possible, technically, you have to give it to them in a way that they can just send that over to another vendor. Yeah, and, and and move their account. And then the last one is uh, right to be forgotten. That just means that in addition to being able to unsubscribe, which we're all good marketers, we've all given people that option to unsubscribe, right? We have to honor requests to totally delete all their data. Yeah. And this is kind of different because for most of us using MailChimps and ConvertKits and so on, the contact information remains in the system so that we know that at some point in the past they, they unsubscribed yeah. and they can't easily be subscribed again. Yeah. Uh, and then for other apps, it, it, there's even more to it. But um, at, at a basic level, we have to be able to delete that information and show them that it's been deleted if they ask. So honestly, be prepared to get those requests. Uh, probably not every day. Probably yeah. not even more than a few a year, but that might happen. Um, there was one thing that we touched on um, in, in terminology that I, that I want to cover, and that's this idea of data controllers versus data processors. Okay. Go for it. These are two really important terms that, that the GDPR uses throughout this regulation, and it's a 271-page regulation, by the way. So if anyone's having trouble sleeping tonight, by all means, download yourself a copy and start reading. You'll be out very, very soon. <clears throat> <laughs> data controller, data processor. You are a company, and you are actively accepting data from an individual. They're subscribing to your site. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes you the controller. You're determining how and why that data is being collected. That's the controller? That's the controller. Okay. If you are using a third-party email marketing mm -hmm. service like Wishpond or ConvertKit or something like that, they're the processor. They're pulling in that data, and they're allowing you to use that data. They're giving you services and whatnot that you can use to send emails and those kinds of things. But they don't have any say in who signs up. They don't even have any say as to what you do with it once they signed up. They're just processing that data for you. Okay. So they're a data processor. It is possible and it's, in fact, probable that these roles will interchange and sometimes even be reversed. So, in your case, you are a data processor for your clients mm -hmm. who want you to run Facebook ads for them, mm -hmm. and they give you a custom audience. That's why I said we'd, we'd come back to this. Yeah. So, they're the data controller. They have, you know, they're the client, your client, is controlling their contact data, their subscribers or their clients, whoever it is that they want to advertise to. Yeah. Let's say it's subscribers for, for ease of language. So you're working for an organization in San Diego. They've got subscribers. They want to run Facebook remarketing ads to those subscribers. So they give you an exported list of all those subscribers. You're now the data processor. You don't have any say in how that data is used. But you're going to upload that list to Facebook, and you're going to create some Facebook ads for them. Uh, so you're just processing that. So that's where you'd have to be part of their privacy policy that says, hey, you as a subscriber, you've opted in. You've said it's okay mm -hmm. to do custom online advertising to you. We use third-party consultants. We use a third-party marketing agency, and they in turn use third-party platforms like Facebook and Google to run those advertising. Got it. Okay. Is there a checklist? Is there? <laughs> <laughs> there are. I don't have one, uh, but there are. There are checklists out there. How do you not have one? Mike Alton, the man of all checklists <laughs> and blogging toolkits, not have a checklist. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's um, th this is the checklist. It's the big three. Yeah. So that was um, that That's was number two. 
Number one was determine consent. Number two, update your privacy policy. Yep. And this language might have to be in there. That, you know, this language of data controller, data processor, that sort of thing might have to be in your privacy policy, depending on what data you're collecting and how you're using it. And I get for everybody watching, me too. I've been pouring over this stuff for a couple of weeks now. Um, this is a lot to take in. And, and I should have mentioned at the outset, uh, we, we've got this great resource from Ann Papalizzo. She wrote this article, this guy. Oh, that's right. Yeah, let it's me on go and... social com. We'll put the comments, we'll put the link in the comments. Uh, she goes through step by step by step. What is the GDPR? Who is it applied to? What do you have to do? What do you have to worry about? How is it going to be enforced? What's everything that needs to be in your privacy policy? Again, this is probably sufficient for 75% of you watching. Uh, some of you will need more than, yeah. than what yeah. Anne, you know, writes in, in that article. But so look at that. Then the last thing is get consent. And this is what's driving people like us nuts because it's one thing for you to force me as the European Union to go and update all of my subscription forms and sign-up forms and have now check boxes and try to make everybody from the EU happy and, and, and informed as to what they might be signing up for. The issue is it's retroactive, 100% forever. Wait, what? You, wait, 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 say that again. It's 100% retroactive. Anybody who's on your list today, even though this doesn't go into effect until tomorrow, anybody who's on your list right now, they have to have given you express consent for how you're using their data. And you have until tomorrow to get that data, to get that consent. So, where's my copy-paste email? <laughs> and where is it in here? Email. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's funny because this is why I've been seeing nonstop for the last two weeks people bitching online. Oh, sorry, complaining uh, <laughs> about all the emails they're getting. And this is why you're getting emails. If those of you in the audience are watching and you're upset about all the emails you're getting from other brands, this is why it's not their fault. It really isn't their fault. Sure. They're trying to comply with the GDPR. And the GDPR is very clear. If there are people on your list who did not expressly consent to be emailed to in any other way that you're emailing them right now, you have to go back and get that consent. So I, I had to do it the same way. I've got people on my list that didn't say, yeah, I want your weekly newsletter. Yeah, I want to know when you go live. Yeah, I want to know what other tools you might recommend or anything else that I might email them above and beyond the kit download or any of those other downloads. So I had to send them an email that said, I'm sorry, but if you want to be on my list, you are going to have to opt back in. Is this for everyone on your list or just only the people in the EU? That's a good question because technically this only applies to people in the EU. Yeah. Here's where it gets complicated, okay? Most of us, if you go into your email list or whatever, whatever you know, wherever it is that we have this data, again, I'm thinking mostly as a marketer, so I'm thinking email service providers like Wishpond and MailChimp and ConvertKit. Mm -hmm. uh, this could be a sales database. This could be a CRM. Uh, this could be a spreadsheet. Wherever it is that that data is, if you can tell exactly where that person came from and exactly where they are in terms of their geolocation and they're from the EU, then you absolutely must get that consent. Okay. The grayness is when, and we probably all have this, you've got people on your list and you don't know where they are. Block them. Okay, I could totally hear myself on your side. <laughs> and I'll be totally transparent. I have 15,000 people on my list. Yeah. 400, only 400, actually 405 people on my list. I knew they were from the EU. I could tell, or really Wishpond could tell from their IP address that these people reside or came, or at least signed up for whatever it is they signed up for mm -hmm. from the EU. 12,000 out of my 15,000 people, I have no clue. So are you going to like poof gone? Nope, because <laughs> that's me. And in my case, and hopefully many of you, there's two considerations. The first is risk. We talked about that at the outset, right? Am I worried that 
someone from the EU is going to be knocking on my door because they got a complaint from a citizen, a resident of the EU, about me and and the data, how, how it's being used. Next, I'm not worried about that. I, I I really I'm not. So for me to take that step of basically unsubscribing twelve thousand, that's seventy five percent of my email list, and waiting for a fraction of them to opt back in. It's not worth it to me. I, I, I just don't believe that I'm going to have that kind of a problem. But here's the second step, the second aspect of it that it, it might be a little hard to explain. Well, it's going to be hard to explain. It might be hard to understand. So hopefully I, I That's can... okay because I will ask all the questions. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say, can you explain it like I'm five? Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's this concept of legitimate interest. And some of the people watching may have seen people talking about this before, which is why I use those words specifically. If I'm on your list and you're sending me information and I sign up for one thing and you're sending me information on other things, if there's legitimate interest in those other things, if you can prove that I would be legitimately interested in those other things, they're related, then it's easier for you to justify those emails, it's easier for you to say to the EU, if they were to ever come to you, that that consent, while it may not have been express, it's it's pretty much a given. So if you sign up to me, to my list, to uh, to learn about Facebook and social media, and I'm sending you stuff about Instagram and YouTube, mm-hmm. there's a really close relation. It's really hard for you to argue, for anybody to argue, that those are just so wildly different. That, that somebody should be upset at getting that information. Got it. So because I'm not doing that in the sense that I'm sending you weird stuff, everything that I talk about is the same. It's all online marketing. It's all yeah. blogging and social media, different social media platforms. I don't go off on rails about other kinds of topics, and I'm not trying to sell you weird offers, right? I'm not pulling you in with a lead magnet about Facebook and then turning around trying to sell you real estate, there's a connection between anything that I ever talked to my list about. So I feel like I have a legitimate argument for legitimate interest. Yeah. And so I'm confident that if somebody were to complain, I would be able to show somebody in the governing body of the EU that, you know what, I am, I'm making an effort here. I did go out and I talked to every single person on my list that I knew was from the EU, and I gave them every opportunity to opt back in. I deleted them. I sent them an opt-in email, and then I turned around and I deleted those 405 people from my list. They're not on my list unless they clicked a button and then put their email back in and opted in. Got it. For the other 12,000, I don't know where they are. In yeah. fact, it's not my fault I don't know where they are. They blocked their <laughs> IP address. They don't keep that information. And so that's not my problem. That's okay, wait, wait, wait. So Mary actually had a really good question, and it was the same thing that had popped into my head. And so her question is, um, do open emails indicate legitimate interest shown from the reader? So if they subscribed, right, like for the mm, Facebook? No. I, again, this is just my personal opinion. This is not legal advice by any stretch. But me personally, just because I opened your email does not mean I'm interested in you. What if they clicked on something related to that offer? Maybe. But um, here you'd have to get a little more grain of what did they click on? Did they click on your unsubscribe link? Because <laughs> that counts. <laughs> did they click on your website to find okay. out what, you know, who you are? Or did they click on an offer that was in there? Now, yeah, cause, and here's where it helps to have things like screenshots and, and good programs. Uh, this is why you should be using you know, professional email marketing services and not sending out newsletters via Gmail where you can't tell any of this information. Oh, my because God. You know, I actually had someone do that to me and I was like you don't have it it's like oh how did I even get on this and you don't even have the option to unsubscribe because it's their personal gmail that they put you on a list yeah. I'm like nah dang yeah but here's you know here's the bottom line for me and, and hopefully for many of you it's that this is just the beginning yeah it's not going to stop with the EU. GDPR is just the beginning. I mentioned at the outset that you know co- the cookie directive is a directive. It's just a guideline that the EU said each of you individual states need to create some regulations and laws that do this. It's going to be replaced. They, it's already in the works. It's going to be replaced by an actual regulation that applies across the board for the EU, which is actually a good thing. Mm-hmm. Those two directives that I mentioned, the, EU, the, the cookie directive, and I didn't give you the name for the first one. I don't know why the cookie directive just makes me smile. <laughs> I know. The EU data protection, back in 1995, the EU data protection directive 
was passed. The problem with the EU Data Protection Directive and why it had to be replaced by the GDPR is that every individual state, 28 different countries in the EU, had their own way of implementing it, had their own laws, their own regulations. Which means if you wanted to do real business in the EU, not just general online business and maybe somebody from Germany happens to buy my course, but you want to target people in Germany, you want to provide them with a service, you had to know German laws. And then you had to know Italian laws. And then you had to know French laws Mm -hmm. because they were all different. The GDPR actually makes it easier to do business in the EU. Got it. Okay. I'm still stuck on one question. Um, yeah. When you were, okay, so when we were saying, because ConvertKit will let me know which of my subscribers are in the EU. So am I to now just only send an email to the, that specific segment and ask them to re opt in? Because we talked about like the other people that are not in the EU. I don't, I really don't have to have them opt in at this point. That's your personal choice because what are you gonna do, risk. dude? I'm trying to like copy you. What are you? Talking yeah, well, there's there's <laughs> risk associated there. Okay, I am not unsubscribing 75 percent of my subscribers. Uh, that would be crazy to me. Yeah, uh, and that would be crazy for me because of all the reasons I just outlined. For sure. But there are bigger companies that not only do they have bigger lists, not only do they have a bigger footprint in the EU for sure. You know, if only 400 people identified themselves as being EU or allowed their IPs to be visible as from the EU. You know, I know that there aren't that many more. I know that twelve. there are not 12,000 people out of 15,000 people that are in the EU. So statistically, there's not that many left of the unknowns on my list. Yeah. yeah. Other businesses maybe can't say that. Other businesses maybe might have hundreds of thousands of people in the EU that are probably subscribed to their services. Maybe their annual revenue is sufficient that somebody who's like a, a government of body in the EU might want to take notice. Like mm-hmm. maybe you're Microsoft, maybe you're Purina, maybe you're other some kind of brand where you're you're doing sales in the EU. You definitely have customers, you definitely have subscribers in the EU and you need to be compliant and you have too many people on your list whether they're customers or subscribers and you don't know where they are that it's better for you, it's safer for you to just send a blanket notification, hey, we've updated our privacy policy. We want to make sure we're compliant. We want to be able to send you marketing things. You're going to have to opt back in. And that's what we were talking about before. That's why all of us are getting bombarded with GDPR spam. It's because those companies have a legitimate reason to be concerned. They want to be on the right side of GDPR. Uh Uh-huh. And they just don't know where you are. And that's why some of us are like, why are you emailing me? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. It finally clicked. (laughs) It just took 10 minutes. (laughs) It's okay. It's a complicated topic. These aren't, you know, hey, do that. It's Yeah. Okay. So let me, let me, okay. So let me break down like what was going on in my head. Cause I was like, if this only applies to folks that are in the EU, why am I getting all of these other emails? Because then that was freaking me out thinking that I had to do the same. But when you said, basically, they're not mind readers, maybe they don't have like a sophisticated email service provider where it tells them that I'm opening it in my specific location, which is in the US. Um, That makes sense. Okay, that clicked. Yeah, it's because they don't know. They don't know that you're in California. And they don't need to do it for you. They, you know that that you're fine. But yeah. yeah, okay, cool. And so you were saying that Joey and Mitch do privacy policies. Well, is and they can correct me because I'm going to say this wrong. Uh, is my understanding is Mitch is a litigation attorney and Joey's actually is a data privacy attorney. Oh. Uh, so so Joey Vitale would probably be a, a great resource to turn to. Uh, Mitch, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm I'm guessing from what I understand. <laughs> Joey's the better resource for legal questions in in this regard. Uh, Just like, I mean, my dad's an attorney, but he's family practice and divorce and estate planning. He doesn't know, he knows less about GDPR than I do at this point. Yeah. Uh, So he would not be a resource. Okay. So we're going to give Joey some love. Joey, Joey (laughs) Vitale.com. Look, he even even has Mitch in his Instagram. What? What? (laughs) All right, this is uh, Indie Law, IndieLaw.com. That is where you could find cool. Mr. Joey Vitali. 
sweet beans. All right, cool. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any other questions in here. We had a ton of questions pop up. Okay, cool. Um, but well, I mean, you, <laughs> not me, you. <laughs> You go ahead and answer them or Mitch by all means like Mitch you know this stuff and Joey can pop in here and do that this was more like the way that I kind of envisioned the show was that like you're you research this well topic I'm going to be like your average business owner that's trying to make sense of this and asking the questions that most people are going to have so um having said that if anyone's looking for like leads the whole freaking entire comment section are all leads at this point <laughs> Right? Yeah, no, no doubt. So, all right, cool. What did is there anything else that we need to have covered, Mike? I still need to check out that privacyskills.com thing because I'm thinking Yeah. I'm thinking for me, especially, you know, doing Facebook ads for clients, like I'll have to ask them as a part of like my onboarding checklist, do you have a privacy policy? Right? Um, cuz you should. And if you don't, then go to Joey Vitali. Um, Mhm. All right. Yeah, and there are online services like, like I said that um, like the service I used. Uh, I'm I'm cheap and I'm a solopreneur, so I did not pay to have my 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 privacy policy created. But again, you know, my perception of risk is is really really low compared to most other businesses. Social Media Hat is a side gig for me, but uh, for those who uh, are concerned and they want to make sure they do this right, there are lots of services I saw out there that are providing you with privacy policy creation services. Some of them are total self-service. You just pay a little extra money and you can have that privacy policy created for you. You can just check all the different services you use um, and it'll create the language and you fill in the blanks and then edit it, read it, edit it, take the time to understand what it's saying at least at a high level so that you are communicating clearly what it is you're doing with the data and why. Do not, do not, do not just copy and paste somebody else's Privacy policy. But Mitch said I could guide. totally copy his. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Love you, Mitch. <laughs> Use him as a guide. I mean, I don't, you know, people can look at the social media head's privacy policy. It's not secret. It's on the footer now of every single page of my site. You know, you can take it if you want to, but edit it. Make sure it applies to you. Make sure it's worded the way that you need it to be word, worded so that it honestly reflects the data that you're collecting, what you're doing with it and why, and then the real stickler is to make sure that you're actually adhering mm -hmm. to what it is you say in there. But for the bigger businesses, that's where they want to talk to somebody like Privacy Privacy Awareness Academy at privacyskills.com uh, because they're, they're the ones that do the training. So if you want, they, they have this really cool phrase called human firewall. And and it just talks about how if you've got I love you know, how you said that that is a cool phrase. And I literally just thought of human beings on fire lined up in a wall like Game of Thrones. The hot <laughs> I was like, what? Okay. But you've got you've got say a hundred employees, right? And all of them have varying degrees of access to your systems yeah. and, and your, your customer data and so on. They need help. They need training. You need help. So Yeah, I would imagine a bunch of like the larger agencies marketing agencies for sure yeah. would have to go there. Yeah. I'll have to ask my husband about this. Um, oh, and it's funny because Karen... you've got staff, you know, you've got th three mm -hmm. people that work for you, um, mm -hmm. you know, so that means you need to have a conversation with them and make sure they all understand, you know, I mean, some of it's kind of like no brainer stuff. Like when I send you the CSV from a client, don't email it anywhere else, you know, yeah. don't, yes. you know, save it places and, and those kinds of things. But, uh, you know, there may be some other considerations that you need to have that's different for everybody. Got it. And so Karen Newland just joined and she also said um, Facebook might start doing that thing again where they're trying to make sure that landing pages has privacy policies in terms of service. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah, I remember like yeah. back in the day they would like shut you down completely for your Facebook ads if you didn't have any of that stuff. Shut it down. You can't sit with this. <laughs> oh my God. Dude, this has been so much fun. Um, okay, cool. So I feel like I have my marching order as well. Like even awesome. before like prepping for this, I jumped on to convert kit and I realized that there was like this really small percentage of people in the EU. Um, and it was funny cause like, I know them. I was like, I know you. I'm not going to say your name. Well, that's here. a great point actually is uh, for all of you still listening and watching the replay, whatever services you're using to process this data, go to them first. Yeah. A lot of them have gone out of their way to put the tools in place to help you. Like I said, wish pond, it was so easy for me to just go to settings and say, Nope, 
you're in the EU, you're not going to see my campaigns until I'm ready. You know, it was literally a toggle button, and that was it. And now I don't have yeah. to worry about all those other pop-ups. Eventually, I will. I'll get to them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, tomorrow's the deadline, and, you know, we, we, we talked about whether or not you should worry about that or, or not. But sure. um, let's try to be compliant in, in advance. Okay. Now I'm, like, thinking, what about mini chat? Because you talked a little bit about chatbots. Um, yeah. And I don't know if anyone has even talked about that yet. About the chat I, you know, I have to imagine somebody has asked ManyChat, what are you doing for GDPR? And if mm. you go to them, I'm sure they, they'll probably have a blog post, an FAQ, something that says, hey, this is what you need to do or don't do. For sure. Okay, cool. Well, Mike, cheers. This has been awesome. <laughs> cheers. Boom. Um, thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us and for dropping in all of your questions. Joey Vitale is here now. So, Joey. <laughs> Jump in there with your comments. I know. Mitch is probably (laughs) texting him like, um, they have your website on. (laughs) You should probably join. We're talking about you. We're talking about you. Um, so yeah, whoever knows information to all of those questions that are in there, by all means, go ahead and jump in there. Um, I know as soon as this ends, I'm going to be jumping on to convert kit and doing whatever it is that I got to do. And yeah, yeah. What- for any questions that are in there right now that I didn't answer live, or if you guys come in on a replay later, I'll be popping in and answering them. It won't be directly after this live. Uh, it'll be later tonight and tomorrow, but I will answer any question or I will refer you to somebody. Yeah. Well, okay. Wait, Kendra said, thanks for making GDPR fun. Uh, hello. I think I, I hey, think it- mission accomplished. You know, mm, mm. we did make it fun. <laughs> we made it like under shadow. I didn't like freak you out. So, all right, guys. Ready, Mike? We're about to bounce. We're about yep. to go. All right, let me let me do We're my good. little outro. All right, bye, you guys. Thank you so much for your time today. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave the comments. We've got plenty of experts in here hanging out. Um, Mike will jump back in, answer your questions. So hit him up. There. Oh, no, there. There. Wait, shoot. There. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Bye. <laughs> bye, guys.